Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, Building and Instrumenting the Next Generation Security Operations Center, brought to you by Dark Reading, Logarithm, and broadcast by UVM. I'm Tim Wilson, Editor-in-Chief of Dark Reading, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A window to the right of the presentation window, and then click the Submit button. At the end of the webinar, we'll ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by, launch, by clicking on the red survey bu button at the bottom of the console. At this time, we recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to the presentation, Building and Instrumenting the Next Generation Security Operations Center. I'm excited to have uh, an opportunity to speak about this topic uh, at Dark Reading, where we have spent uh, a lot of time uh, talking with readers about how they're approaching the, the growing numbers of threats that they're dealing with and, and, the, and the huge volume of malware issues that they're, that they're wrestling with. And uh, the Security Operations Center is, is more and more is the answer to the question. A lot of companies are thinking about building one, um, or they have one, and they're thinking about upgrading. And today we'll have a chance to talk about the right way to do that, um, the best uh, methods, best practices, um, some, and some of the technologies that are out there for building the next generation of stock. Um, to discuss the topic, we have two uh, excellent speakers. Our, our first speaker is uh, Roselle Safran, uh, co-founder and CEO of Uplevel Security. Roselle was previously the Cybersecurity Operations Branch Chief at the Executive Office of the President. There she managed the 24 by 7 Security Operations Center that protected and defended the White House's network. Prior to this role, uh, Roselle was the Digital Analytics Deputy Branch Chief at the Department of Homeland Security's U.S. CERT. In this capacity, she managed daily operations activities for the computer forensics and malware analysis teams and was instrumental in building two threat intelligence platforms, one used internally by all of the U.S. CERT analysts and one used by over 50 federal departments and agencies. Roselle was named one of the trending 40 power women of D.C. Tech for 2016, and she's a graduate of uh, Princeton University. Hi, Roselle. How are you? Hi, Tim. Doing well. Thank you. Our second speaker will be Chris Peterson, co-founder and senior VP at, of customer care and CTO at Logarithm. Uh, Chris co-founded Logarithm and, and currently serves as senior VP of customer care and as CTO. Prior to Logarithm, he was uh, he led product marketing for the Dragon Intrusion Detection product line as part of the Interasis networks. He was also a faculty member at the Institute for Applied Network Security providing expert advice on it on out across North America. His 21 years of cybersecurity experience began at Price Waterhouse, serving as a senior consultant and developing a pri proprietary GRC solution. He later joined Ernst & Young's National Information Security and Risk Management Practice, where he held a management role and was responsible for leading the development of software solutions including eSecurityOnline.com, an, informa an Internet Information Security Portal, and Managed Vulnerability Service. In 1999, Chris was an early employee at Counterpain Internet Security, a pioneering managed security services provider. At Counterpain, he served as an engineering manager leading threat intelligence research and supporting the development of Socrates, their back-end SIM technology. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. So, um, we're looking forward to the presentation. Just so the audience knows our, our flow, we're going to hear from Roselle for about uh, 30 minutes or so. 
um, and then we'll hear from Chris, and then we will have uh, uh, hopefully at least 10 or 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, but you don't have to wait um, to ask your questions. So as you're listening to the speakers, please feel free to use that console, ask questions all during the, the session, and then we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Roselle, to get us started. Great. Thank you, Tim. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Logarithm. Thank you, Dark Reading. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to talk to everybody today about building and instrumenting the Next Generation Security Operations Center. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background on me, um, I know Tim already mentioned some of it, but I've been in cybersecurity for, for quite a while now. So I started doing computer forensics back in 2004. And yes, my ENCE and CISSP are still valid today. Um, and so I was doing computer forensics for a variety of, of, of different organizations, the most recent being Ernst & Young. And Ernst & Young obviously works with a lot of very large enterprises. Uh, from there, I went to the Department of Homeland Security to, to U.S. CERT, and U.S. CERT has a very unique perspective on cybersecurity because they have this umbrella view where they can see what's going on to an extent um, for both government agencies and critical infrastructure companies. So I had the opportunity to, to work with a large number of organizations and really understand what was working and, and not working with them. Uh, and then from there, I moved up over to the Executive Office of the President. Very, very exciting opportunity there. Um, obviously, no shortage of, of interesting work to be done. And so I was defending the, the network used by the White House and the re rest of the agency. Um, so, so my team was a 24 by 7 shop um, with, with plenty to do. And I was working on both the, the tactical side, uh, making sure any vulnerabilities or uh, incoming issues were, were being addressed readily, but then I also spent a lot of time on figuring out how we could improve. Because when you have a SOC, obviously you are always thinking, how can we be better? How can we do more? Because you know that's what the other side is thinking. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time on, on trying to find out, figure out ways that, that we could make our operations even better. Um, and what I found with that was that when it came to responding to to the alerts that were coming in and running them to ground and dealing with incidents that there was a, a big shortage when it came to the, the technology that helped with that process. And that's what eventually prompted me to start up-level security so that, that we could address that issue in a, in a very effective manner. And so with up-level, we work with an organization as small as startups with, with about three or 400 employees, all the way up to, to the Fortune 500 large enterprises, multinational corporations. So the main takeaway with all of this is I feel your pain. I know how challenging it is to, to be doing security operations, and I and want to share my experiences to, to help make the job a little bit easier. So let, let's start with the purpose of a SOC. Um, so everyone in security knows CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your, your organization's information assets uh, and, and systems, that's, that's what you want to protect. And so when you look at how security operations evolved, well, you, every organization has its crown jewels, uh, whether it's intellectual property, financial data, customer data, any combination of all of the above, and, and so they, they need a way to protect it. And so initially, that really just involved building up a wall around it uh, and, and trying to, to prevent any attackers from getting in that way. And so that eventually be, it became apparent that there are still ways to, to get in despite best efforts of, of prevention technologies. And so that's when you need to be able to detect what's coming in and, and what's going after your, your crown jewels. And then over the last few years, organizations have discovered, well, yes, it's important to pre prevent, and yes, it's, it's equally important to detect, but then once you detect, you actually have to respond. And there's a whole process involved around that for cleaning up and, and mitigating when, when you have something that has breached your systems. And so what we have now is essentially this this triad 
of prevention, detection, and response. And the three of them go hand in hand. They feed off of one another. And this is the, the core of a security operations center. So how does the next gen SOC differ? So this is the Roselle definition. You're not going to find it in any textbook. But this generally sums up the, the main points about it. So a next gen SOC uses a systematic approach to optimize the abilities of its people, the capabilities of technology, and the structure of processes to most effectively protect against an increasingly varied, adaptive, and sophisticated set of adversaries. So you are using all that you have to its greatest extent to try to ward off all of the challenges that are coming in on a regular basis from a very large and adaptive group of adversaries. So how do you develop a next-gen SOC? Unfortunately, it's not as easy as just buying the shiny new product that has next-gen in the name or APT or advanced in the name. That is not the way to do it. And so what I've done is I've looked at what I've seen are the main components to building a next-gen SOC. And you can basically sum them up into five key areas, which I call following the trail. So that's thoroughly scoped, resilient by design, automated to streamline, intelligence-driven, and learning continuously. And so what I'm going to do for, for the rest of this presentation is walk through each of these five components and show you how they affect the people, technology, and processes. So thoroughly scoped. This means when you're building and you're planning on how you want to build your SOC, you're taking into, a, into account how the SOC relates both internally and externally. So externally meaning within the greater organization. Now, if you are already building a SOC and you already have something in place, I would advise that you still return to this step and make sure that you're thoroughly scoping as you build forward because this is the key aspect to making sure that you're getting off on the right foot. So how does this work with the people? So at the heart of any SOC, you have your analysts. And historically, you've had your tier one, which do some an initial investigation, um, some initial gathering of, of information, maybe some light correlating. And then you have your tier two, which is looking into the, the issues more deeply. Uh, and then your tier three, which are your advanced malware analysis, computer forensics, um, network analysis, where you're digging into PCAP, for example. And we'll, we'll talk more about the tiers later, uh, but obviously this is the core component for, for any SOC. But when you're, you're thoroughly scoping, you have to look at other components as well. And one of the, the other key ones is the other business units within the, the organization. So gone are the days when the cybersecurity team is just tucked away in a little corner and doesn't have any interaction with the other business units. It's actually completely imperative that, that the SOC has constant interaction and communication with other business units in order to be a next-gen SOC. So those other units could be the network administrators or net, network operations teams, the help desk ticketing system, possibly HR, or if it's a big case, legal and, and public relations. There, there are plenty of organizations that the SOC needs to develop relationships with uh, when, they're, when they're doing their operations. And also we have insider threats. So you know, historically we think of attacks as coming from, from the outside, but there are occasions when, when they're coming from the inside as well. And so increasingly what I'm seeing is that insider threat is falling under the fold of cybersecurity operations. And from a technology perspective, 
being thoroughly scoped means starting with the foundational elements. And this is really an important issue. And I see time and time again that it's a big challenge for, for organizations to even have this, this basic foundation level really squared away. So, and when, when you look at the technology in general, you're, you, I have it categorized as prevention, detection, and response, but those are fluid boundaries. And there's a, some overlap and some back and forth b between them. And I'm going to talk in terms of capabilities as opposed to specific technologies. And a lot of technologies will cover more than one capability. And so just keep that in mind. It's, it's not a necessarily separate product, um, but a capability that's important. So on the prevention side, being able to filter email, network traffic, and endpoint data. That is really critical um, and, and often really overlooked, but, but when it's done, it, it's incredibly advantageous to the, to the organization. So I, mean, I spoke, spoke to one company who filters about 80% of the email, and you can imagine how much easier than the work is for the security team when they have that covered. In, in inventory management, that's making sure that your software and your hardware and your configs, you, you know what should be there, and, and you have a grasp on that. And, and vulnerability management, um, that, yeah, that's an oldie but a goodie um, and very important component as well. On the detection side, you need to be monitoring the email network and endpoint data, um, you know, keeping tabs on what's going on and, and what looks suspicious. And related to that is the, the log management, and that could be the, the logs that you're monitoring and also additional logs that, that are going to be of value, like your DHCP or DNS log or something along those lines. And then on the, the response side, you need a case management system. And one of my big pet peeves is when I see case management systems that are not designed for cybersecurity. All the other tools here, everyone make, is completely on board with making it uh, cybersecurity specific. But for some reason, people think, oh, with case management, I could do something designed for a help desk or for software development. Uh, and you really need that cybersecurity specific case management tool. And then you need the visibility to investigate the email, the network traffic, and the, the endpoint data. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're logging everything, you know, specifically with the endpoint data. You just have to be able to reach it when you need to. And there are a couple other items I'm not including on here, like ID management and access control, um, which, which are your, your standard elements, um, not, not often uh, necessarily a SOC responsibility. And only when you have that foundational element completely in place can you really effectively start building on those advanced capabilities. And we'll talk a lot more about what some of those advanced capabilities are. But I just want to stress the importance of getting the foundational down first. You need to be able to crawl before you can participate in the Olympics. Okay, and then from a, a processes perspective. So at, at the very core of your, your SOC is, of course, your people. And so you need to be able to define their roles. And likewise, you know, right after that, you have your technology, and you need to be able to define how that fits within, within your organization. But on top of that, you, you need to have an understanding of your policies, your business policies. And this has a big impact on your operations. So something like whether you can block webmail, or block USB access. That will profoundly impact how you run your operations. So you need to be able to, to keep track of those policies and if possible, be able to influence how those policies are written based on the, the metrics and the information that you have from, from your operations. On top of that, you of course have your playbooks. And I, I have prevent, detect, respond. A lot of it melds together. Uh, but you have your, your general workflows of how you're going to incorporate your, your team and your, your technology together. And I would say one important rule of thumb is that you should have each team and each technology in at least one or two playbooks. If not, then you need to rethink your, your playbooks a little bit. And then you have performance metrics. 
and I call it performance metrics because I want all four to be P's, uh, but that's it's you know, your metrics. So those are on the, the managerial perspective where you are relaying what work you're doing to upper management. And then there are metrics on the operational levels that are, you're using to, to improve how you're doing your, your day to day. And then you have your plans. And so the plans are often a combination of playbooks together with communications wrapped around it. And that's, that's also really critical for making sure that, that you have the, the overarching view of everything fitting together well. And so what I'm provided at the, the end of, of each section here is just a, a recap of, of everything that I went over um, in, in case you, you missed something on the, the animations there. And so you have it for, for when you're, you're looking at the, the deck later if you'd like to. So that's just a recap on thoroughly scoped. So moving on to resilient by design. So there's a lot here. Um, so when when everyone thinks of, of resilience from a, a thought perspective, they're they're automatically thinking of uh, the tactical side of responding to incidents, and that is absolutely a, a critical component for for SOCs. But there are also operational and strategic issues to address too. So operational is um, if, if your your security infrastructure goes down, which I will say is no picnic. If your case management system goes down and you don't have visibility on tickets coming in, or if your your prevention tools are suddenly defaulting to open instead of close. There are lots of potential problems that can happen that you need to be able to respond to. And then on a strategic level, you, the business that you're, you're providing your, your SOC support for is going to have change. And so being able to adapt to that as well is, is, is absolutely critical for, for a next-gen SOC. So the, the one certainty in all of it is that you know that there will be change. And so you have to respond in, in an effective manner. So, so what does that mean on the people side? Well, you have your engineers, absolutely critical to operations, because they're the ones that are often doing the, the implementation of, of the technology. Um, you know, the analysts are more than, than overtasked with, with all the, the work that they need to do, and so it's great if you can have an engineering team in place um, who can, can handle that work specifically. And in, gen, in general, when I, when I talk about the, the people here, um, you know, uh, the bigger organizations will have separate teams, uh, but obviously the smaller organizations will have people fitting different roles and, and wearing multiple hats. Um, same could be said with engineers, but it, it's really great if you have full-time engineers that, that you can devote to, to looking at the architecture. And then we also have red team. Um, you know, so looking at that tactical side of, of, of resiliency, you know, the red team helps you see where the holes are before the adversaries find them. Um, and so with red team, you have to make sure that the whole process of, of red team does not be become a, a game of gotcha, where the red team says, aha, look at all that we found, look at what you're doing wrong. But instead, you're, you're working side by time, side by side, and red and blue are, are learning from one another. So to, to one company, I had a, a great approach of having the red team do some activity, and then the defenders coming back and saying, aha, this, I saw this show up in this log, I saw this happen, I saw that happen. And so you're, you're creating this, this great back and forth where, where both teams are, are learning and improving the defensive posture as a result. And then another aspect of resiliency, which I know is tough, is is going 24 by 7, um, or at least following the sun. And I know you, it's, it's challenging um, when when the government shutdown occurred in 2013, um, and, and a lot of my team was furloughed. I ended up working on the night shift um, for for several weeks. Uh, no picnic, totally get it. Um, so, so any managers out there, I would say you need to have a, a very um, comfortable night differential for, for the people that are working on the night shift. Um, or you can do a follow the sun model, but then you run into some challenges with working for, with people in, in different countries. But, but either way, a next gen SOC is going to have to be on the ball 24-7 uh, because you know, the attackers, they, they don't just work nine to five. Um, and even if they do, their nine to five is not necessarily our nine to five. 
All right, so getting to some of the technology here. There's, there's a lot that goes into this on the resiliency side. Um, so first, of course, pen testing. You know, if you've you got red teams or the like, um, you want to be able to, to see what's wrong before someone else does. Then on top of that, the response. So it, historically, a lot of responses just focus on, on that investigation component of it. But really, you want it to have three full levels. Um, the first being triaging, so that you're responding to the most pressing issues first. And then you have that investigative process, which is, of course, iterative and, and can be quite lengthy. Uh, and then you want to, to remediate, mitigate, clean up, um, and, and capture those lessons learned. And so, so the response now needs to have those three components in order to, to be most effective. And then from, and that's on the tactical side. Now getting to the operational side. Uh, the, the main issue is that eventually all next-gen SOCs are going to have the infrastructure in, in private clouds. And I know some of you are thinking, no way, that's not happening with our organization. We had a whole talk about this with management, and we have too much regulation, too much sensitive data. We're, we're not moving to the cloud. And I recognize that issue. I completely hear you. I had a very similar mindset at my last job. But the reality of the situation is that you're going to keep having those conversations every six months until you eventually move to the cloud. I mean, we, we talk to, to customers all the time that are, are moving their security operations to, to virtual private clouds where they have control of the environment, um, but, but their infrastructure is in the cloud. Uh, and then, you know, bring your, bring your own device is becoming pretty prevalent in most organizations. So having some, some form of mobile device management, which covers, you know, a, a bunch of capabilities. I, I lump them all together into this management. Uh, that's, that's going to be absolutely critical. You don't want just any old device ending up on your network and, or any of the devices that you have for your employees, um, just, just going all over the place and logging into Starbucks Wi-Fi's or the like. Um, and with that, there's also a component for if you have executives, for example, that are traveling overseas, um, the, the mobile device management is increasingly important then. And of course, I said, you know, move, moving to the cloud, there's, there's cloud, cloud protect, prevention and detection technology that, that comes with that. Um, sometimes it, it's based, baked in with, with what the providers um, of the, the cloud systems uh, have available. And then there are some that are more specific to, to what your, your business is doing. So, so with all of these, that, and I'm adding here now, these are more for the, the, the business side, that strategic side, where you're, you're adapting to the changes that are coming within your organization, and you're building your security posture accordingly. Um, so, so with some, you have the crown jewels. Is, is web server based or application or database uh, related. So, so then you, you need technology around that as well. And what I'm also seeing increasingly is that, uh, especially the large organizations that have um, locations in multiple countries, they're looking at the physical security monitoring and they're fusing that with their cybersecurity data in a very interesting way. Obviously, Insider Threat does this, um, but, but there are some other areas where it can be done as well. All right, so that's a lot of technology there. And then on the, the processes side. So number one, always number one, training, training the team members. So as you bring in all those different technologies as you're evolving with your organization to, so that you need those additional capabilities, um, then, then the, the team needs to, to be trained up on all of that. Uh, then in terms of, of making sure that your, your playbooks and your, your plans are actually effective, a great way to do that is, is with periodic exercises to really get a feel for, for what's happening uh, productively and what needs room for improvement. And when there are needs for improvement, then make sure that that's documented. Uh, what, you, what you don't want is to have these situations where you've got exceptions, and you know, the exceptions are in the heads of a couple analysts, but they're, they're not documented so that when, when something really goes down, you're, you're not really prepared for it. 
And then there's always implementing technology. And this shows up on every process slide because, you know, we, we're, we're not working with an abacus or a slide ruler. Um, we're, we're dealing with technology all day, every day. Um, and so implementing technology is, is absolutely critical. You certainly don't want to have shelfware. That, that doesn't help anybody. All right, so a little recap on resilient by design there. So moving on, automated to streamline. Uh, so first point I want to make with, with automating to streamline is that automating to streamline does not mean that the whole team is going to be just going home. That means that you're going to be more effective with what they're doing and making sure that you're using the, the automation capabilities as they're required. So first issue with that is then you wind up with your tier one analysts have not having that role anymore. And I know you're saying, well, you just said you're not going to send all the analysts home. And I, I'm not. Um, what, what I will say is that they then move to tier two and tier three. And that creates tremendous human analytical power if you can move them to those levels. And you get far more bang for your buck. No, no organization can really afford to, to just have tier one functionality when that talent could be used elsewhere. And then on top of it, you have the hunters, uh, which is a, a relatively new group that is doing a lot towards making sure that finding detect ways to detect in innovative ways is, is done effectively, and that when those ways are discovered, you can automate them out in a, in a manner that, that makes it rote going forward. So the technology involved in streamlining and automating to streamline. Well, sandboxing is a pretty common one um, for, for malware analysis. Graph analysis links a lot of it together. And then you have your playbook orchestration, which is very common um, for, for just connecting everything with APIs. And then you have tracking the responses so that you're actually seeing what can be automated going forward. And then you, you need to train your, your analysts for new roles. You need to assess that tech periodically, make sure it's not a, a black box um, that, that's not helping you any. Uh, you need to update the, the playbooks to include the automation and add in some, some new metrics to make sure that uh, all that automation is actually improving your operations. And then you, of course, have to implement your technology. So intelligence-driven. That's where you want to make sure that you're bringing in all of the information that you need, um, whether it's IOCs or other types of data. And you have threat intel analysts that are great at, at finding out what's, what needs to be focused on, both from an IOC perspective and a geopolitical perspective. And so the technology involved is simply threat intel management and scoring and report generation. So you don't want to have a situation where you have far more intel coming in than what you really need. You want to be able to take advantage of the information in a way that's effective for you. And that means scoring it properly and having a way to report it out in addition to, to managing it. And so managing it does not mean just having a spreadsheet or a text file. You have to be able to go beyond that. And so the process, of course, revolves training your, your threat intel analysts um, and the rest of the, the team on what that threat intel means. Assessing the feeds to make sure that they're, they're actually pertinent to your investigations and to your environment. Uh, updating your playbooks to include your intelligence. And then implementing the technology, of course. And last but not least, we get to learning cont continuously. So this is where you have this, this positive snowball effect of what you learn um, then is used to, to find something new, and then you pull that in to, to learn even more. And so on that side, we have, we're seeing more and more innovation departments where you have these different units that are just looking for startups that have new technology that, that they could implement into their uh, ecosystem. And you have internal auditors, and again, this is not a gotcha game. They're working with the teams to see what's working, what's not working, 
and and how you can learn from from what you have to to make the operations better. And on the technology side, this is where we get into a lot of the technology that people automatically go to when they think of next gen. Uh, so, for the first of all, baselining is, is really critical. You need to be able to separate out what you what you know is good and what you know is bad. And so, once you have that insight, then you have something. You have some anomaly detection because you can see when something bad pops up that doesn't match with with what you know is good. On top of that, you have heuristics analysis. You know, everyone knows of AV using heuristic analysis, uh, but you can also you use it basically all the time with a sim as well, or, or something along those lines, where you're saying you have a set of rules, and and this is what what I know is indicative of something that's probably bad, and you can you can set uh, heuristics to that. Um, that works on the response side as well, because you can um, also Incorporate heuristics, for, for example, with escalating issues from um, you know, just alert level to incident level, saying when you know X, Y, and Z in indicates that it's something really serious. And then machine learning, of course, you know, one of the big buzzwords, definitely has some, some great uh, capabilities. You, know, you see it with user behavior analytics, where you have machine learning combined with baselining um, to, to give you an understanding of, of what's going on, and that crosses the spectrum, prevention, detection, response, and, and likewise, predictive analytics. Um, yeah, this is sort of a Venn diagram between machine learning and predictive analytics. They can encompass each other, they, they can be separate, uh, but what you're doing is leveraging what you have, what you know, um, to, to better predict and, and move forward. And so then in the process side, of course, you have training. And I could really spend a whole, whole webinar on some of the training you can do. It doesn't all have to be uh, external. It doesn't have to be very expensive, but it needs to be done. Um, you need to fine tune all of the appliances, especially on the detection side, on a regular basis, just to make sure that you are keeping up with what you know and not creating a situation where you're, you're flooding your team with, with information that, that's not going to be very helpful. Um, you're, you're updating the, the playbooks on a regular basis as you learn what's working and, and what's not working. And you're, you're implementing your technology once again um, to, to make sure that that learning is happening on, on two levels, both for the, the people as well as the technology. So that's learning continuously summed up. And that pretty much sums up, sums up what I have. Um, yeah, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this. And uh, feel free to, to ping me if you have any questions about anything that, that I mentioned. Um, thank you all for your time. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Thanks, Rosal. I'm, I have to say that that is one of the best presentations I have seen on building the, the stock from People, process, and technology, um, you, you've got it all laid out there. Um, I'll remind the audience that you can download a copy of the slides uh, at the end of the presentation. I'll, I'll give you information on how to do that. Um, and you can also, if you missed anything, because I know she had a lot of material to cover, if you missed anything, you can also watch this over again um, in, uh, on demand. So we'll give you instructions on how to do all of that. Um, I'll also remind the audience, you can ask questions at any time during the session. I've, I see a couple of good questions already in there. So if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them uh, any time, and we'll, and we'll get to them um, as soon as uh, we, we – first, we're going to give a chance to, uh, for Chris uh, to talk us through um, uh, his perspective on this process. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll toss it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Roselle. That was, uh, that was, that was great. Um, hi, all. Chris Peterson here. Um, so if, when we look at you know, everything that you know, Roselle's laid out, uh, I really couldn't agree more. Um, as, as a company at Logarithm, you know, what we really have been focused on since the founding, um, when we started Logarithm, was, was really reinventing SEM and log management into what it should be you know, to power the next-gen SOC. And, and, and as Roselle rightly pointed out, there is no magic technology that's going to do this. Um, that just, you know, you know, out of technology, 
suddenly appears a SOC that's fully functional and delivering the right organizational value. Um, it really is the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the confluence of technology and innovation, but you know, how that optimally brings together you know, people and process uh, to you know, realize um, you know, fast detection and, you know, and, and, and response within that security operations center. And as a company, you know, that's what we are very much focused on and have been focused on um, and innovating in a couple of key areas around analytics and automation, which I'll touch on here in a second. But as we look at the problem and as we look at the SOC and where Logarithm fits in the SOC, it really is to be that platform that brings people and process together to help organizations focus on and reduce what we think are the two you know, critical operating metrics for SecOps to, uh, for today and tomorrow where you know, the first metric you know, is, the, is the organizational ability to detect threats, you know, threats that actually represent real risk to the business. And we call that the mean time to detect. Um, detection is not when an alarm fires from a sensor, um, because we get a lot of those every single day, too many in most cases. Detection is when um, you know, a, either technology you know, or, or an organization or a person has said, we know this is a real threat, um, or we're highly confident it is, and it requires more investigation because we believe there's real risk here. You know, that is where detection you know, you know, is and, needs to be, and, and how it needs to be thought of. The second metric is in that mean time to response. You know, so once where there is a threat you know, that we have qualified and we believe represents real risk to the business, how quickly can we respond to that? You know, how quickly can the organization fully investigate that threat, determine conclusively, is this a true positive? Is there an incident here? And if so, you know, how fast can they organizationally respond to that threat to reduce or eliminate you know, the risk to the business to an acceptable level? And that's the mean time to respond. And I think, unfortunately, what we see today um, and why we see these, you know, these high-profile data breaches and organizations experience these really, you know, really damaging cyber incidents is that these two metrics um, will be measured in most companies in weeks or months, when in reality, given the threat landscape, they need to be driven down into you know, days, hours, and minutes. Um, there's simply too much motivation out there right now to do you know, bad things in the world of cyber, whether it be criminal actors, nation states, um, you know, what, what have you. And companies need to be focused on you know, how do we detect, how do we respond faster, and technology is going to be the key enabler to that in terms of doing this efficiency, efficiently across the teams that you have. And so if we look at our focus as a business, um, it is to really help organizations effectively realize what we call for life cycle management, you know, really that end-to-end -end detection and response workflow across a technology platform that does bring people and process seamlessly and efficiently together. Where this workflow begins with visibility, um, you know, the acquisition, you know, of, you know, of data. And there are you know, multiple different ways in which we can get visibility into the environment. Uh, the first is your security event data. Um, you, you know, you, you've all bought a lot of security products, and they generate, some, you know, in some cases, you know, high-quality intelligence. They're, you know, they're alarming all the time about things that are suspicious. The challenge is uh, there's a lot of suspicious things that happen every single day, and these technologies can block certain things. In other cases, all they can do is warn. Uh, but those warnings are creating alarm fatigue in a lot of cases. However, we can't, we can't ignore them. It's a high-quality source of data that does need to be consumed and made, and made useful. The other source of data is log and machine data, um, the general system logs, application logs. Um, and that data set is an understanding of what happened, who did what when. Um, and this is very important when conducting a forensic investigation to actually understand, you know, is that threat real? What was the scope of the incident? Um, what did that user do? Um, how is that host compromised? When was it compromised? That's very critical in that regard. But also in this data set is the comprehension of what's normal and what normally happens in the environment if we can leverage that data effectively. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then lastly for visibility are forensic sensors, um, you know, products that can give us deeper visibility, um, products in the endpoint, and detec you know, endpoint detection response pla you know, place like Carbon Black. Um, we have our own sensor as well. Um, or network forensic sensors, um, you know, um, uh, full packet capture products. You know, we've got a product there as well, but there are other technologies out there also that can provide, provide this visibility, you know, that can passively record all network communications at your ingress-egress points, um, capturing all packets if that's as far as you want to go. 
where, again, this data can provide great insight from an incident response standpoint, where we can now actually look and see what data actually left my network and when did it leave over what period of time. Um, that data also is very useful in behavioral modeling, uh, which, which moves us on to the next part of the, uh, the workflow and the capability. And, and that moves us then into, you know, the actual detection and prioritization. So once we can see, we, we can begin to detect and prioritize. There really are two principal ways in which the SOC you know, will detect and prioritize threats that require further qualification and investigation. Uh, the first is what we call search analytics. Um, it's leveraging that visibility through kind of search-based tools to ask questions of that data. And this is principally used um, in things such as reviewing reports, um, um, and also in things like hunting, where if you have a team that can hunt and can actually look for threats, search analytics is fantastic. Um, the challenge, though, is that um, search analytics does require people. Um, and in some cases, in a large enterprise, lots of people, people that are hard to get and people that are hard to retain and people that are expensive, um, you know, too you know, expensive and often out of the reach for a lot of organizations. So that's why the second method um, is, is, is so critical and, and where we believe the future is when it comes to the art of detection in the enterprise. And that is more machine analytics, um, leveraging all of this visibility that we have um, across our security devices, across our log data, forensic sensors, to apply um, AI-like techniques, um, you know, machine learning, behavior profiling, corroborative analytics across this data set to get to a class of threats that can only be seen in a centralized analytics approach, leveraging all that visibility. Um, and also to better prioritize, you know, the, the, the alarms and events coming out of your other security products by infusing things like environmental context and risk context, where the goal of machine analytics, you know, is to ultimately serve up to the organization really high-quality intelligence, you know, that, that smaller set of alarms that are infused with you know, business risk that the SOC can now reasonably consume. Because in reality, most organizations, you know, you're, you're, not, you're going to have finite capacity. There are only so many alarms you can actually get through every single day. And we need technology. We need, we need automation that can analyze this data and serve up the right intelligence uh, with, increasing, with, with increasing accuracy over time so that the next step of detection can happen uh, very quickly and effectively, and that's you know, qualification. And qualification is now when you know, a human operator you know, does need to get involved, where ideally you know, what, a, you know, what a human operator is looking at um, is a small set of automatically qualified and prioritized alarms that they can quickly get through because the platform has made that easy for them. And so you know, here's where features such as uh, machine-assisted investigations are very important. So imagine if, you know, what we're looking for is a behavioral anomaly for, you know, for a user count. You know, we're modeling maybe three or four different behaviors, and you know, where they log in from, frequency of login, time they log in, and maybe what they access within the environment. And these are all things that logarithm can do. Um, now, if we see some of those behaviors trip um, across maybe a baseline of seven days, there's a lot of data that went into that baseline, potentially millions and millions of logs. So when that human operator needs to qualify this alarm, the logarithm is now generated and says, hey, I think this account's compromised, it needs to be the job of the technology platform to serve up the right data set to that analyst. So that analyst is now looking at the, 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 the information of highest relevance that allows them to make a decision of, you know, is this a false positive or a true positive? And so that's also where machine analytics plays a key role is in that machine-assisted investigation process where the technology itself is intelligently serving up the right data set so analysts can make, make quick, well-informed decisions. Um, and you know, that is then you know, what gets us to detection. You know, actually a human operator saying, yes, I believe this threat is real, and now I'm going to move on to the response time, where the first part of then response is then a full investigation. And here, as Roselle you know, pointed out, you need case management. Um, and I loved you know, her comment about you need a case management system designed for security because security is unique. Um, in security, we cannot trust the environment around us. We have to assume the entire environment is untrustworthy. And if we're using IT ticketing systems and we're using things like email to communicate, we're using the file server to collaborate across documents, those are all untrusted repositor repositories and communication channels. So that's why we have um, in our platform built our own case management solution 
that has a cyber evidence locker, you know, that controls who can collaborate on that case with tight access control, that ensure all communications are encrypted, and those communications and history stay within logarithm and don't leak more broadly across the organization. Um, and that is a, a critical part of a security-driven um, case management system. Um, of course, also we need to integrate, though, with third-party ticketing systems, which, which is also important to action on the response side. But in terms of that investigation you know, process, what's critical here is that you have a facility for bringing in all that forensic data, that, you know, and that, 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 that deep intelligence in a centralized place where you can effectively collaborate across your team and also route it through potentially multiple tiers of workflow. A lot of SOCs, you have a tier one team, a tier two team, maybe an IR team. And you want to be able to route and move cases as they go through the qualification, through maybe initial investigation, now to full response, effectively through a system that makes sure there's real-time visibility and routing to get, you know, you know, highest risk incidents in front of the right people so they can, they can investigate action as quickly as possible. And then we want to couple that with automation because once we have an incident and we know it's, it's real, um, there's real risk, we need to neutralize it. And here's the second you know, key area that automation plays a, a critical role today and going forward. Um, and in our platform, what we have you know, built is what we call smart response. You know, it's the ability to create plugins so that you know, we built or our customers can build that can action a wide variety of responses across the IT environment. So if that user that we're um, investigating in terms of you know, that account being compromised, you know, gets, you know, that, that investigation gets moved into a case, um, the Tier 1 team looks at it, and they say, yes, this account's definitely compromised based on what we see in the data. They move it on to an incident. Um, we can have smart response now teed up to do things like disable that user account, where within that centralized secure workflow, a button can be pushed with a pre-qualified, pre-tested action that can, within seconds, neutralize the threat of that account by disabling it through Active Directory or some other um, identity access management system. And that's the other key area of, acceler of accelerating the time to response is that automation on the, on the IR side. Um, and you know, it's not just automate the response, the response is also to automate workflows through investigations as well. And being able to do things such as, I need to go see what maybe some other product thinks about that IP address, or I want to you know, launch a virus total and pass, and pass this file hash to it. Those are things we can automate as well. We're from that, 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 that um, user interface, you know, which this workflow is being executed. Um, ideally, it is also automating um, investigatory actions around that workflow into other systems um, with, you know, very seamlessly because time is of the essence. Um, and then lastly in our platform, we focus on, the, on, on recovery, you know, where this kind of, you know, I think really wraps up, you know, why we believe in, you know, that when you can deliver this workflow on one platform, you get the ultimate efficiency because if this entire workflow and all this data is, is done in one platform, the recovery process is very quick. You have access now to the full history around the case, the incident, all the forensic data in one place to then marshal the full cleanup action and also then to review what was done and, and, and to adapt so we can do better next time. And so in, in whole, um, what we've built um, over more than a decade now is a platform designed to deliver you know, this workflow end-to-end, -end, bringing automation around machine analytics, automation around response to make it possible to efficiently drive down organizational time to detect and time to respond through the optimal combination of technology, people, and process. And one of the things that we've developed to help um, organizations, you know, get to a higher maturity is a maturity model. Because practically speaking, a lot of organizations are still just struggling with, I need to do log management better and have centralized visibility. Um, we've yet to actually leverage things like user and entity behavioral analytics or have yet to look at, you know, how we you know, maybe build a SOC, even a virtual SOC with two or three people and get them working effectively in a case management system. So our maturity model is designed to um, give organizations kind of a stepping, you know, kind of a, a step by step path for across years, raising their maturity, you know, really of their SecOps, leveraging a platform like Logarithm as well as those critical technologies that enable uh, this workflow around, around our platform. And we have a white paper on this and would encourage you all to read it. Um, and and uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to, uh, back to Tim. Thanks so much, Chris. I know one of the, uh, well, the, the only disadvantage of having really good speakers is that there's never enough time. Um, there, uh, there, there are so many issues to cover here, and 
and and uh, you both brought up so many good points. Um, we've got a bunch of questions here. We may not get to all of them. I want to reassure the audience that we will have uh, um, the ability to answer some questions over email. So if we don't get to your question, uh, we will definitely uh, try to get back to you by email. Before we get into the Q&A portion, I want to um, uh, tell the audience that we have a um, survey here in, in front of you. Um, it's a feedback form that uh, will uh, give us a chance to get some feedback on this particular session. If your, if your pop-up blockers have prevented the form from launching on your computer, you can click the red survey icon at the bottom of your screen. To complete the form, pl please press the Submit Answer button at the bottom of the page. Uh, thanks in advance for filling out the feedback form. This helps us to better serve you. With that, um, I'll just remind the audience we have some questions here. If you have a question, um, please go ahead um, and type, a, type it into the Q&A uh, icon on the bottom of your screen and click the Submit button. Um, you know, we've got questions. It, it, there's an interesting cross-section in the audience. Um, we've, we've got some folks from small organizations and some folks from large organizations. So let me ask one from each. Um, we ha one of the, our audience members is, is the, the net of the question is, this is great, um, but what if my organization isn't big enough to have, you know, three tiers and threat hunters and insider threat people and, and that sort of thing? What are the key sort of capabilities and functions that I need to have um, if I'm in one of the smaller organizations? Can, uh, maybe both of you want to take this, but uh, either one of you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, that's a, a very good question. Certainly not, not every organization is, is very well resourced. Um, so it, when you have that type of situation, you wind up with, with the analysts being sort of a jack of all trades. So they're spending some time on analysis. They're spending some time on threat intelligence. Um, they're even sometimes spending some time on engineering. And uh, it, it makes for very well-rounded cybersecurity professionals, which is, is great. So, so there's a lot of value in that. Uh, but in, from a technology perspective, I would say if you're a small company, just focus on that foundation, foundational level that I was talking about. Don't even bother with any of the advanced analytics or advanced capabilities yet. Just make sure you have those fundamentals down really well because uh, there's a lot that you can do with that, and there's a lot of power in, in having that um, set up in, in a very effective way, and it can stretch your team a, a lot further if, if you have all of those bases covered. Yeah, yeah, you know, I guess I'd just, you know, add, you know, add to that, um, that I think if, if, if you are, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're small, if you're, you know, small business, um, and, and you get practical resource constraints, I think for one, first focus on what you want to protect. Um, I would instrument that with monitoring, make sure that you understand what's happening around that environment. And I think ideally, see if you can allocate some resource, I mean, even like time box it and say, you know, we, we are going to monitor for a class of things around our highest critical data or systems, and we're going to do it two hours a day. And I'm going to make sure I've got somebody on my security team who is at least going to look through the highest priority alarms for that part of, that part of our environment we said is most critical two hours a day. And if it's one person doing just that, you begin to build the organizational muscle memory around some of that detection and analysis um, 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 process and can then build a little maybe IR on the back of that, even using IT as your IR side. Um, but I think you know, if I focus on what's most critical and begin to get some of that monitoring capability built in in terms of looking at some of the highest priority alarms and, and issues around the environment. Okay, that's, uh, this is great. Um, let me ask uh, a, a question on sort of the larger end. Um, you mentioned uh, performance metrics. I think uh, they were talking about your presentation result. Um, you know, are there KPIs? Or, you know, how do you go about measuring the performance of your SOC and and um, you know and how it's doing? Are are do you, can you give the audience some ideas on what you can do to kind of give a sense for you know what the activity levels are and how your organization is performing? 
Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Unfortunately, it's usually very enterprise specific, uh, you know, based in, at least in part on the technology that you have. Uh, what you don't want to end up doing, though, is, is creating these very basic metrics that have no value behind them. For example, the number of tickets closed in a month. Uh, because that, that doesn't tell you very much. You know, if that number goes up, does that mean that you're becoming more efficient? Or does that mean that you've had a, a lot of noisy alerts that you knew you could close right away? Uh, so what, what you want to do is have what I would call sort of compound metrics, where you're, you're looking at, at more than one variable because it, prov it provides a better picture. So instead of just saying, you know, well, I, I just want to look at the number of, of alerts um, or incidents in total, maybe you're doing something like mapping it to, to the cyber kill chain. Uh, where So you can see, well, over time, the number of incidents that have progressed to, to this advanced level has decreased. Um, and, that, and when you can see the, the different stages, then you can also gain a perspective on like, how much time it, it takes to do the analysis. Because yeah, even if you're, you're, the amount of time to, to finish one uh, ticket goes down, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're more effective. Um, and so you want to be able to, to capture how difficult a, a ticket is in, in addition to, to just that quantity. Um, so, so from a, a the perspective of, of reporting to management, then if looking at something like the kill chain and, and those types of, of metrics are um, of better value on the operational level it's, it's really going to depend on the technology and and you want to keep a, a close eye on that to make sure that that what you're you're working on is is actually in improving your operation um so yeah false positives that's that's a, a big one any any detection tool or, or sim that, that's giving you a high false positive rate um that's something you need to know about and so you need to have metrics around that so that that you can you can tune it down um and then res responsiveness again you need to factor in different variables um but but that's that's also in, important to to consider um and so so those are just a, a few of them but we, i would just err on the side of not not looking at really simple metrics because that ends up often just doing you a, a disservice. Chris, did you have any thoughts on that? Well, I would say just gen, you know, generally, I think it's a it's it's a tough thing to get meaningful metrics around. I've actually been thinking about this a lot myself. I've had some conversations with some big financial um, provide, you know, customers of ours who are asking me those questions because they're struggling with this some these you know, some CISOs. Um, I think um, I guess you know, the one metric I might, I might throw out there for organizations who are kind of getting started in this is maybe start with a metric around visibility. I personally think visibility is one of the most important things you know for organizations. What can we actually see, you know, so that we have a, a chance to detect and, and what's what volume of data we have that would support a response process. So you know, maybe look at you know what are our critical systems in our environment, what's our broader environment. And what is our, our visibility percentage from a logging standpoint across the environment? I mean, that's a basic metric that I think is, is very important as a foundational metric in terms of the ability to detect and defend you know, from cyber threats. Yeah, I like that one. Well, I'm going to apologize uh, to uh, the audience because we're, we're just about out of time here. But, um, we, again, we, we do have questions here that we will try to get back to you on email. And I want to thank our presenters today. I thought you both did a, a fantastic job. Um, for more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Building and Instrumenting the Next Generation Security Operations Center, brought to you by Dark Reading, Logarithm, and broadcast by UBM. This webinar is copyright 2016 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Dark Reading and Logarithm, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinion. On behalf of our guests, Roselle Safran and Chris Peterson, I'm Tim Wilson. Thanks for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.